Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Kahn Report wherever you get your podcast. You're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. In a minute, I'll be joined by Nikki Javala from the Washington Post as we preview the commander's training camp, going through all sorts of different projections, veterans that may be on the bubble, that may be would never have been on the bubble with in the past because of their draft status. Does that matter anymore? No. <clears throat> a lot of talk about Jaden Daniels, the defense, all sorts of things we're looking for in training camp, which of course begins on Wednesday. The veterans report on Tuesday. On Tuesday, I believe we'll be talking to Dan Quinn, maybe Adam Peter. So I'm going to be having another podcast probably Tuesday night slash Wednesday morning getting ready for training camp. And then I will have training camp updates after every practice. So tune in for that. Make sure you come back for all that good stuff as we keep you, as I'll keep you updated on training camp and have guests on throughout. And if you want to become a club member, go to the Empire Media YouTube page, see the word join, click on that, find your level of membership you want and go from there. For you gold members, I will be doing a lot of private Zooms this summer and throughout the season. And I'm going to try be trying to get as many guests on there, probably, probably hopefully getting one guest, another guest on there at least once a month or so. So anyway, that's all the good stuff. I will say, and again, the one last thing is that for ESPN, all the ESPN NFL Nation reporters had to do a training camp preview. All that stuff is going to run, I believe, on Tuesday. So check back for that. It has, you know, big storylines. Training camp will be a success if, and then also roster, 53-man roster projections, which to me was very, very difficult this year. There are some going to be some tough calls for a couple of reasons. One, because you have a new regime. Two, you have former high draft picks that, You know, guys like Fedarian Mathis, could he be in trouble? What has he shown in the first two years that suggests he shouldn't be in trouble with a new regime, right? So, you know, and they also brought in a defensive tackle that spot. So there are a lot of questions at those positions. Then there's some other injury issues that could pop up that affect the the 53-man roster that, you know, we... F.A. Obata, what's what's his situation like? How is Ricky Stromberg? Is he recovered from his his knee injury from last year? That was a tough knee injury. So, you know, where is he at? And so I think there's going to be some of those that play into this roster. Maybe they get kept on. Maybe they get put on pup. We'll see. Anyways, all the pup stuff will be decided on Tuesday when the players report and they get their physical. So anybody who opens on pup will find that out Tuesday late later Tuesday afternoon. And I will be doing, a, again, I will be doing a podcast after we meet with, um, I believe again, I, it, at least Dan Quinn, maybe Adam Peter. So anyways, tune back in for all that. So Nikki and I are going to get into all this good stuff. A lot of training camp preview, vets on the bubble, uh, things that we're watching for uh, the defense. We're talking a lot about the defense. So all that good stuff. So here's my conversation. Oh, by the way, you can follow Nikki on Twitter at Nikki, N-I-C-K-I Jabvala, J-H-A-B-V-A-L-A, and read her work on WashingtonPost.com. So here's my conversation with the Washington Post, Nikki Jabvala. Will Jaden Daniels climb to the top of the NFC East? Will the commanders zip past the competition? We'll have to wait until the season starts to see, but you can get a head start on the competition this summer at the Adventure Park at Sandy Spring. Named the number one aerial adventure park in North America by USA Today, the country's largest ropes course and zipline park is now open seven days a week. Located in the heart of Montgomery County, Maryland, the adventure park offers climbing, ziplining, axe throwing, food, and more. Experience adventure day or night with your family or leave the kids at home for one of the exclusive Keep It Lit adult-only events. These summer date nights are perfect, featuring glow lights music, fire pits, and endless adventure. With challenges anywhere from beginner to expert, there is something for all skill levels. Not looking to scramble through the trees? Keep your feet planted in the pocket and throw a perfect spiral at axe throwing. You can throw at traditional targets or play any number of interactive games. You can even upload your own image. Anytime you're thinking about reaching new heights, make sure you know before you go. 
The Adventure Park at Sandy Spring is the only ACCT accredited park in Maryland or Virginia. So there you have it, folks. The best climbing, zip lining, and axe throwing in the country right here in the DMV. Reserve your adventure today at www.theadventurepark.com backslash climb. Nikki, I had you on here for one reason, and he's that little fella right there. So much. There you yeah, go. Yeah, I, I thought he'd be asleep by now, but you can see how successful we've been at the sleeping napping situation. So he's getting his 15 minutes of fame on the John Kine yeah. podcast. Well, 20 minutes of football conversation might put him to sleep. We'll see. <laughs> you know, I and you might know what his future is based on if he gets excited or if he's like, yeah. oh, God. Jay Daniels again, left tackle. Oh, snooze. Come on. Let's right. go. That that's kind of what I'm, what I'm in for anybody who's not watching Julian's in the picture. So, and if you have, if you want to go watch, you got to go see how cute the kid is. So, and I can attest not that, that I'm biased or anything. He's a cute kid. He's a cute kid. You should post some pictures of him on Instagram. Oh, I should, you know, I haven't <laughs> done that in a while in like a whole hour or something. There, he, there, there you go. So, Anyways, um, good to see Julian. But yeah. so as we tape this, there are a few days reporting, but as this airs, it's going to be like reporting the next day. Right. What are you going into training camp? What are you most curious or who or what are you most curious, anxious to see in camp? Aside from Jaden Daniels? Well, we can start with Jaden if that's yeah. what it is. Like, yeah, I mean, let's, all right, let's yeah. start with Jaden there. Then we'll go yeah. to who's next. To me, I'm I'm I will be most interested to see, you know, obviously the the left tackle spot, you know, kind of where do things stand there? How do both guys, the rookie Brandon Coleman and the veteran Cornelius Lucas, how do they look there? How are they kind of divvying up the reps? How are they kind of working through that? But honestly, I'm most interested in the defense. Mm -hmm. um, I want to see how they're, you know, kind of what their vision is on the back end. You know, they, they have a lot of new pieces of the secondary, a lot of really talented guys in the secondary. How are they envisioning that? And then the linebacking core, I mean, two really, really solid veterans and Bobby Wagner, uh, Frankie Luvu, some good depth guys. Um, you know, how does Jamin Davis fit into the mold? How much has that group as a whole improved? And how does it work with the secondary? Because you've got guys that are extremely versatile, like Luvu. Um, so I, I'm, I've always kind of leaned more defense. I, I just, I don't know. I, I like watching defense more, but um, I think it'll be very interesting this year just to see how Dan Quinn and Joe Witt kind of put their stamp on this group um, and, and how they're, how they're envisioning things because it's, you know, they have, you know, some key returners, obviously Doron Payne, Jonathan Allen, but, you know, to me, the bulk of the defense is a blank slate, you know, they're edge rushers, linebackers, secondary. So I'm curious to see well, how that starts. And to those shake. are kind of key spots too. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I think along those lines, I'm curious to see like, how do they start to, they're not going to show us everything in training camp, but I am sure. curious to see like the scheme and just what they're asking the line to do as far as pass rushing, the aggressiveness. And, you know, too often in the past, it was now this would have put Julian to sleep watching this defense because like, Hey, we got four guys up front, go get them fellas. That's, that's what the pass rush plan was. So what does it look like now with this group? And right. that's, that's, and also like Jamin Davis, does he help them yeah. at edge or not? Yeah. Yeah. And is he truly playing on the outside, which I would yeah. imagine he would, he, he was in many game and OTAs. Um, but, you know, in that previous regime, they talked about it a lot and never fully moved him out there. Um, so, you know, where is he lining up? Can he help? You know, is, you know, can we get a, a glimpse of sort of his status with the team? Because it's, you know, I don't I don't think it's guaranteed really that anybody outside of, a, you know, some clear few guys from the last team make it. Um, so I, I think you got to go into it like everybody's kind of questionable at this point. Um so does, does he have a spot on this team? That that to me is is a very valid question. Yes. Um, and I will I think we'll find it out pretty soon on. To that point, and I was going to ask you about that about like vets on the bubble, right? And that could be anybody from the previous regime outside of a couple guys. And I think Davis right. would be chief among them, right? You know, right. Um, you know, uh, Fedarian Mathis. Fedarian Mathis, I'm on there. Yeah. You know? Especially with you know. 
never mind Johnny Newton's status, but the fact that they did draft a really good pass rusher, that high interior pass rusher, I, I think you have to wonder, you know, what is Phil Mouth's status? Um, and the fact that he's dealt with so many injuries and, you know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I think I would still be a little surprised if they moved on from Emmanuel Forbes without right. fully seeing what he is. I mean, the first round, and these are fully guaranteed contracts, you know, it's just, you know, you can't really do that, but you know, there, there are some guys on the depth there where, you know, I, I, you're not sure how they fit if they make it, you know, like, but we'll, we'll get some clarity here soon. Well, and I, I think it's also, for me, it's like, you're going to ignore where these guys are picked. Like ignore the fact that Matthews is a second round pick. Don't keep him because of that. Keep him because right. you think he can help you because this is the one year you get that free pass for all these kind of moves, you know, in the future, you're cutting a second round pick in the future. That was yours. Not good. You're cutting a second round guy from the past. It's acceptable. Right. You know, this is their free right. pass year. Right. Right. No, totally. Totally. And, so, and you know, but, but it is like, I, but you know, and I don't know what Mathis does. And I think you put anybody from there. Like, who would you say would, I mean, Terry, Duran, and John Terry, Allen, and Duran, Cosme. Cosme. Yeah. I mean, there's a handful. I mean. Brian Robinson. Andrew, Andrew Wiley, unless some stud veteran comes available after like roster cuts, but like, that's more of contractual reasons. It doesn't make sense to cut them now. And you you need somebody to play right tackle. Right. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a limited few um, Dotson, you know, but, right. but I mean, and receiver, I mean, I'm segueing for you. You're welcome. Um, I mean, that's another group where it's pretty, it's pretty open outside of the couple, two, maybe three guys. Um, you know, they, they, I feel like, almost every year in camp they go in not fully knowing, you know, how are those last receiver spots going to be filled out this year more so. Um, and how the new kickoff rule plays into that, how they envision that returner spot could also factor into the number of receivers. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's quite a bit of competition in this camp for Washington quite a bit. Right. And, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be some great team this year because of that, but there is like the, those bottom roster spots, like, you know, and, and when, when Quinn was in Atlanta, they always kept six receivers. So I figure there's that, which are the, is Jamison Crowder for sure on there. I like, I know like the, they like his leadership in the special teams room that right. matters, but you still got to right. show it on the field. And, right. you know, is Deami Brown, like we've been waiting for more production from him but he's got mm -hmm. that speed still and you don't have a lot of depth that helps him, right. you know, and, right. and then how good is McCaffrey? So I think there, there's, right. you know, does any, is there anybody beyond those six who's really ready to threaten to earn a spot? Do you think like we saw Tinsley, Tremaine and Kaz Allen, any of those guys, do you, you know, I feel like they're kind of all in that same group yeah. of fighting for the remaining few spots there. I mean, Zacchaeus, he's another one. I mean, just, you know, a veteran. I, I think he's has a solid chance. But I, you know, without seeing him in camp, without, you know, without anything really, it's it's hard to know if he's a step above some of these other guys that were from the previous regime or otherwise. But yeah, I I this is just my belief going in. I mean, I not everybody agrees, obviously, but like I I still feel like the top three going in, and this isn't necessarily based on the first two are obvious, but like, I, I still would put Luke McCaffrey at number three, not, not because he's the third best receiver necessarily, but because they drafted him in a third round. I know you shouldn't always do that, but the fact of the matter is this regime drafted him in the third round, um, which is higher than probably other teams might have. Um, so if, I feel like he 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 makes the roster because I don't think oh, for he's sure. not the waivers, so I don't think that's a question. But I would put him in the top three right now. And and that's that's the he's a guy that I'm really intrigued to see. Just yeah. and that was part of it going in too. Like, what does this rookie class look like? Because this is the these are the those are the building blocks. Like this class is the building blocks for the future. 
And I think so, like, if he goes in there, it looks like he can play. That's a big W for them. Um, but, yeah, I don't know, like, has Deami Brown really shown enough that he should be figured as the third guy? I don't think so. Now, as a blocker, in the, you know, for the run game, he's always done pretty well. But you got to do more. And so, right. Zacchaeus, like, they do have ties to him. So, anybody that they've signed that they have ties to kind of kind of give the edge to. Um, and he's one of them. But, yeah, I mean, with McCaffrey – I'll be curious to see like what are the little things that he's still adjusting to at that position that maybe, right. you know, where, how does that manifest itself? But also like right. Jahan, I mean, this is a huge year for Jahan. Huge year for Jahan. Huge year. Yeah. Like I, I don't necessarily think he needs to worry about his spot, but he needs to worry about proving himself to mm -hmm. this coaching staff and frankly, the league. So I think myself included, so many people were, pretty high on him going into last year. I really thought he was going to have a monster year because um, he started to come on as a rookie. He really showed where he excels as a receiver. I, I think his route running is superb. Um, I think he can create separation with the best of them, um, but he had a number of drops and it was just a, a, an off year for him. Um, and he knows that. I mean, he's, he's told us that like he was just not happy with his performance at all. So you know, I, it's a big year for him. And I, I think the big, to me, a big key for him is getting off the line of scrimmage because yeah. when he would face press, it's different. And it's, it's, that's right. a challenge for every single receiver in the NFL. Can you beat that? Because if he beats, <laughs> if he can get you with that. He's quick enough at the top of the routes to then create a lot more space. And that's where right. he excels, but he's got to show, can he do that consistently or can they right. move him around enough? to offset that because he yeah. can be a weapon we saw that the second part of his rookie year he was really good in that right. and so like but yeah he's one and um you know but is the other part is obviously offensive line with coleman yeah. and yeah can he do it and again we don't we have no evidence from the spring whether he can or he can't it's because there's yeah you know, he's just a mystery at this point um yeah. you know it's hard to really get a good gauge on the offensive linemen, the guys in the trenches and the backs without pads on. It's hard to, you know, they may look good on paper, which is awesome, fine, but until you put the pads on, you don't really know what you have. I also think, and we've talked about this, about how, you know, the joint practice with the Ravens last year really started to poke holes in what we thought were solid positions on this team last year in camp. Like, the secondary looks solid when going against their own offense. You put them against another offense, oh dear. Um, so I, I think having two joint practices should be good. I don't think it can hurt. I think it no, should think like, help them. By the way, speaking of like the receivers and like, you're talking about getting off the line. Have you watched the Netflix? I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> I haven't watched I it mean, yet. I mean, you can turn on any highlight of Devontae Adams and I mean, his releases are just insane, but you just realize like how otherworldly his releases are it's just insane and it just yeah. made me think of, like i was thinking back to like terry working on that a couple of years ago like really emphasizing that and like how some guys just make it the quickness at the line and just every detail of their route is just so important you see that in a lot of veterans like like terry jahan and some of the younger guys really start to learn that if they're smart really start to learn how important those details are and i think like for jahan it's the hands because Yes. When you would, when I'd watch him last year and you motion to a stack where yeah. there was the D backs then have to play a certain way. He yeah. can win with his feet, but right. when he, but he's got to start winning more with his hands in those situations. And I think he knows that. And I remember talking to Bobby Ingram about this, just, you know, like he hadn't had to do that as much before. Right. So right. I think it's still something that's a little bit new for him, but, yeah. but that's where it's going to be key because if you can do that, now you make yourself a better receiver because right. you can only like at some point, just like with any receiver, any left tackle, you can protect the left tackle, but at some point you got to win one-on-one -on -one totally. against a pass rusher. So, you know, and same thing with a receiver at some point you've got to win that, but it is like watching guys like Devontae Adams and just the footwork. Cause you don't know where they're going and you know, they're good with their hands. So you can get them with your feet and it's, you just have more as Terry says, tools in your bag. And that's one thing I've always respected about Terry is, you know, you at, like every year we ask them because we know, right. What did yeah, you do so. in the off season to get better yeah. in the spring? He talked about um, yards after the catch, right. 
And I think it was Dan Quinn was talking about like how he noticed him doing things in practice that yeah. would simulate that. Like right. that's how you create, go from a third round pick to a multi-year thousand yard receiver. Right. Right. You know? there, so, there's a, there's a plan behind everything. There's, there's intention with everything. I mean, you see, with Bobby Betts, you see with Bobby Wagner too, which I, I yet another reason why I think he's a, a huge pickup for this team is just to have more examples on in all three phases of guys that do this. Right. Um, I think at times that was missing. Oh, for sure. What's your, what's your confidence level in those vets to be able to help this year? What are you looking for them this summer yeah. to see what they can do? I'd say it's pretty high. You know, the, the bar was set pretty low. I hate to like, I hate to be yeah. totally disparaging to the, you know, whatever. Um, it is what but, it is. It is what it is. But yeah, I mean, like it's it's hard to deny what Bobby Wagner does on the field. You can't you can't question it. The guy's the guy's gonna be like a first ballot Hall of Famer. Like, you know, what he does works and he's detailed and he's sort of built a career not only on his success on the field, but his longevity and being that successful. I mean, the guy is still really freaking good in, you know, however many years it's been. And he understands the value of sort of paying it forward to the younger guys. I mean, I think that's pretty well documented. And I think, you know, there's sort of a ripple effect. Guys feed off that. I think Frankie Louvu could be another, though he firmly believes he is not an old head, that he's still a young guy at year seven. But he's a type that, by example, is sort of a sponge out there. And I think having sort of that humility to still understand that there's plenty of room to improve and have a willingness to ask others. Um, I think you see that with Terry and, you know, young guys like McCaffrey. I think they're sort of mm -hmm. of the same mold where they're, you know, they don't feel like they have everything figured out. Um, so, yeah, I like Chin on the back end. I think that was another good pickup. Um, Zach Ertz on offense. I think Eckler maybe. Um but I also wouldn't discount what Brian Robinson has already been through and learned at this point. I think he's, you know, been through more than most <laughs> um, on and off the field, unfortunately. Um, so I, you know, I, I do, I think they have these veterans scattered, which is, is great. It, it's paramount to a successful team, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think like Robinson and Eckler can complement one another too. Yeah, like, totally. Totally. You don't want Eckler carrying the ball 15 to 20 times a game. Yeah. No. You know, and, and you're not going to have, you know, so you can, there's a role for both of them. Um, but, you know, so I think that that makes a big difference. Ertz to me, it's right. just about health. You know, yes. can he, uh, I'm expecting a good camp from him. I'm expecting a good start from him. Can he sustain that? Cause the last couple of years, you know, you get up there, you have a couple of injury years. That's where the questions will come for him. But, you know, um, I think that'll be to me an interesting thing to watch in camp, but how, how that part unfolds and like, what what how they're using guys as well right. and so right. um what are your for Jaden? oh i know i'm going to go back to that too because you brought mccaffrey in the certain mindset i mean he was the one guy who's coming in with Jaden. right five, no I, whatever I, 545 I, yeah totally and, and I, I i think Jaden's of the similar mold like somebody told me like for the espies right I, I know exactly where you're going you know the story I so you've been told us how you know he's been he's from the LA area he's been working out there again um SB's out there so you know they he gets his award and he he drives out there that night walks off stage gets right in his car to leave because he has training so I which I I mean isn't the norm to like bask in your award go to parties afterward enjoy them whatever i mean and to each his own i'm not saying any of that's wrong but his mindset was i gotta get back to training this is just an interruption which you know listen, how could any fan or gm not love hearing that so i would say anybody listening to this or watching this yeah. is going to like hearing that because it's he had to be nudged to go get the award because he didn't want to miss any training yeah. time so yeah that's you know, and so like that is a big thing, and that's the mindset. Like, yeah. haven't always seen that here with some of the high-profile young fellas. 
So, yes. you know, that's, that's one thing I would say. So, but what are your expectations for him this, this summer? What I, I, I you think he's going to win the job? <laughs> Don't get me started, but I, I think it will still be a thing. I mean, he will start. We know this, like, come on, like reason through it, people. He's also like the best quarterback on the field. So there shouldn't be any question whether he's a vet or a rookie or otherwise, but um, you know, I think, the team, and we've talked about this, how they are cognizant of sort of the outside pressures for any rookie, especially one as high profile as he is, and at that position, which is a pressure cooker anywhere in D.C., where they've generally sucked for the better part of two to three decades. Like, yeah, um, it's an important job, and they know that. Um, so I I think they will – they're not going to outright declare him a starter – why they even need to, I don't know, but whatever. Okay, fine. We'll play this little game. But I don't think they're going to declare it, and they're not going to treat him as a true starter in terms of the media, in terms of right. all that, until, you know, late preseason when, you know. So I, I think they are they want to send the message that you still got to earn this. and But I don't think he's the type to – ever feel offended by that i think he would expect that um and i i think that's just gonna be the way it is like he's yes the job we all know it's his but i think he'll look really good at camp i do now i don't think it'll reach the level of hyperbole that we've heard throughout mini camp and otas like he's the greatest gift to quarterbacking since you know whatever but you know we're not a single ball has hit the ground. Like, stop. Um, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard you but, say that before. Yeah. Um, but I think he'll look good. Um, and I, I think there will be plenty of reason for optimism. I think there will still be bumps along the road, as there always are with rookies. Even the greatest rookies, even the greatest quarterbacks of all time had bumps along the road in their rookie seasons. Um, but I, I think he's got the complete package, the mindset, the physical traits, the, you know, the work ethic and just the natural talent. I, I agree. Like I'm, that's kind of what I'm expecting from him is a good camp. And, you know, to me, by the end of the spring, I mean, in the spring, you, there was, he was the best quarterback there. Oh, and definitely. So, so I it don't like. Close. And they weren't, they weren't even doing anything. It was still very clear. Right. You know? And I, and I do think like, they're not going to be pushed into a decision and because last year they got, I think they felt like they got pushed into having to make an announcement on Sam Howell, maybe before they want to, but I don't think this group will certainly not be nudged that way. I think Dan Quinn and these guys have been pretty good at being firm on this is what we're doing. This is when, you know, we'll tell you when we tell you, we're not going to be pushed into, we're not going to rush into it. I think that's kind of the mindset, which is fine. Like you shouldn't be pushed to it. If you're not ready, if you want to wait till three preseason games, fine like we still know he's going to be the guy right but, and but, also but, like if your team like if you're letting outside voices push you into anything then there's a bigger problem there but correct there, that correct that's a whole other discussion <laughs> yeah and but but yes and i but i don't think that's going to be the case here and i do think it's good for them to say like hey if you're going to be true to competition you have to be true to the competition and i think right. that's what they're going right. to do so you know right. um but then last thing, like, what constitutes a good camp for these guys, do you think? I want to see them look comfortable out there. There was never a point last year where they looked comfortable. You know, there was always sort of that underlying tension with a certain play caller in the offense. Um, it never really felt like the defense had a firm grasp on what they were being taught. I want to see these guys look comfortable and playing fast. Um and then I, I want to see like when they do make mistakes, do they, do they make them twice? Do you see the same things come up? Do you see the same errant throws, the same misreads, the, you know, and, you know, I think a lot of what we have to keep in mind just as spectators is that we may not always know exactly what we're seeing, like right, you right. Know, an errant throw might not truly be the fault of the quarterback though. That's our, knee-jerk reaction is to blame the guy throwing it um so i i think there needs to be some more nuance to what more context around what we're seeing and interpreting um 
But that's generally what I would like to see from him. Just a more cohesive group, a guy that looks like a, a team that looks like it's being developed and well taught right, right. Um, where you don't have a lot of looks like I have no idea what I'm doing, or you see guys that don't even know where to line up or, you know, you know, eliminate sort of the silly mistakes. Well, and like last year, cause last year it was all about playing fast, but I didn't always feel like it was a crisp fast, right? Right. It was playing I, fast at, you know, the expense of, Detail right, because like, because there were definitely times where they'd get yelled at to like, you know, either they're not doing this or that or this. Never heard any of that. This, and they looked a lot. They were playing at a better tempo or practicing at a better tempo this past spring. Yeah. Does that continue? Because that, to your point, that's a sign of them learning and getting what they're doing. And there, for sure, they're going to be a lot of speed bumps. I mean, I still don't like. We'll talk about this later in camp, but they're not. You're not going into the season thinking like, oh my God, they're going to challenge for the division. Like they've got to show improvement. They've got to show that they can, they have a good foundation to build on to finally, finally build something sustainable for the future. So, you know, I think that'll be a big thing. And how do you think Brandon Ayuk is going to fit in? (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. I had to wait for that one. I wanted to end on that one. You were sitting on that one. I know you were, you were sitting on that one. (laughs) Yeah. 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 But, but it is like, it is like the good thing is Nikki, it's fine. It's here. We can, I get tired of speculation. Like this I, guy, it no. could do this, could do that. Well, let's could freaking do see it. I get yeah. tired of the talk. Like, yeah. you know, but for, unfortunately with this team, it's like, usually it's seven months of talk yeah. it's done early and all that. But like, let's see if but they- listen, the, the bar is set very low. I will yeah. take, bring that Ayuk speculation. I will take- Oh, for sure. Ridiculous stories about top golf. I will take any of that over multiple- federal yes. and NFL led investigations yeah. into misconduct. So for sure. Um so far time. Listen, a year ago it's we're a new era. Minnesota. Yes. A year ago at this time we're just getting back from Minnesota. Yes. After the sale. Like you know, and that was the first thing, but like you knew there was still gonna be the remnants of it. And now wait, did you tell the people? Did you can I break this to them? Can I breaking news on the John Kime podcast? John Kime went on vacation <laughs> yeah, a think, real vacation a real vacation it, it was yeah you heard but, it here first but the hard part is like you're so trained to anticipate what's going to happen or that you've got this mindset like i know there's all the stuff that you know i think it'll, it might be another year i had a good vacation i'm not going to lie but you know i think there's still the remnants of that the ptsd for from a yeah. Sort of the aftershocks. Of, yes, you know. yes. The PTSD is wrong. Yeah. Right. But, but yes, that, but yeah, anyways. So, anyway, Nikki, um, thanks a lot. And I'm glad that Julian is doing well. So, he's, he's pretty great. Do you want to add anything to the conversation? No, he just would like a bottle sooner and rather than later. So. How's that three cone drill time? He needs, he's getting faster. You know, it's not quite up to our standards yet, but he has explosive hips. You know, he's low to the ground. <laughs> you know, he's a, he, High ceiling guy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Tell him to use his height to his advantage. There you go. <laughs> All right, Nikki, thank you. Of course. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Nikki for joining me. And thank you, as always, for tuning in. I'll be back with another episode, either, like I said, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, and then again after every practice throughout training camp. Talk to you next time.